Okay. Hey guys, welcome to uh, Trials, Tribulations, and Triumph on uh, mobile video on Android and iOS. Uh, today we're going to talk about things we've tried, failures we've had, and then ultimately successes we've had and approaches we've used uh, in production. So, uh, I'm Andy Pryor. I'm a full stack dev with Huddle. I've been with Huddle about nine months. Um, been working on .NET backend, video encoding. Um, I'm on the record and sync squad, so basically we're responsible for capturing video on iOS right now, and then moving video all the way back to our backend servers and coding our video and making it ready for distribution again. Um, in the past life, I was a backend Java developer at Cerner in Kansas City. So, check it in the video. Go ahead. Oh, I'm Shelley, Android developer at Huddle. Previously, student at Iowa State University, just graduated this past May. Before that, also a technical co-founder of a company called Thought out of Des Moines, so it's a tech crush company. So, yeah. Oh, I'm on the video playback squad for Huddle, which means we care about making the quality of the video that people watch on Huddle just amazing. So. Cool. Uh, so most of you are probably familiar with Huddle if you've been to any of the uh, meetups the last couple months, but I just want to give like a quick rundown for people that aren't. Um, Huddle is a sports video software company, so um, it, one of our mottos is we help coaches and athletes win, and we do that by providing a full suite of video analysis tools that you can use from any computer, any device, um, for any type of athlete from club and youth all the way up to elite professional sports. So, uh, Headquartered in, in the Haymarket in Lincoln, uh, we also have an office in the Old Market in Omaha. Okay, for our talk today, uh, we're going to start with a video primer, just kind of lay out the, the nuts and bolts, the inner working of how digital video works. Um, we're going to talk about FFmpeg, which is an open source uh, encoding tool that we use at Huddle. We're going to have uh, uh, John give an architecture overview of some recent rewrites that we've done to our Android video playback uh, infrastructure. We're going to demo part of uh, the Android app, and then we're going to talk about Huddle Technique, which is um, a, a really cool iOS app that we use to uh, for a specific use case. So feel free to ask any questions at any time. Um, uh, yeah, so no need, to, no need to wait to the end. Just raise your hand, throw out a question. So with that, uh, let's start. So the video primer, like our goal is to just expose some of the high level concepts of video. Um, if you dive into encoding real deep, uh, you might find that some of the things we talked about were just generalizations. That's just a disclaimer that we have. But uh, our goal is really just to expose the, the high-level concepts, the high-level constructs that goes into encoding video digitally and, and playback. And the, the reason that we're doing this is so that you can use these constructs to construct your own intuitions and troubleshoot and manage your video in the future. You don't necessarily need to be able to write a video codec or a video encoder to be able to use video, but you might need to troubleshoot why your video is behaving a particular way on your platform. So we're just going to start with some of the high level nuts and bolts, but like I said, it won't get into the real nitty gritty details of video encoding. Uh, yep, so with that, let's get started. Uh, the most basic element of a video, uh, of video is the frame, right? So let's start there right at the beginning. Uh, here's a frame that I've uh, grabbed some, from some test video that we've uploaded into Huddle. This is a 720p frame, so uh, there's 720 horizontal bars of pixels and then 1280 uh, uh, vertical columns of, of pixels. Uh, you're probably familiar with this. The P in 720 doesn't mean pixels, it actually means progressive, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, 720p right now for us is, is, is the max encoding that we use on Huddle. You can step that up to 1080p, that's going to be HD. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of 4K monitors, that's actually going to be like four times HD, so it's going to be 4,000 uh, horizontal bars of pixels, which is pretty insane, but that's how you get great video quality. So uh, a single video frame really isn't encoded that much differently than just a still picture, like what you would use with, with JPEG, right? Um, but if we want video, we're going to have to have progressive frames rendered to us on the screen sequentially, right, from a stream. So uh, when we do that, we're going to capture them, and we're just going to line them up into a, a video stream. Now, here I've got two frames that I've pulled out of a video sequence, and you can see that the frames are almost identical. Like if you didn't get up, uh, if, if you got up real close, you might be able to see that the volleyball uh, along the bleacher lines there is a little bit higher on the right hand screen. So uh, there is motion that's happening, but uh, there's a lot of duplication, right? These frames are going to be rendered to you. Most video that you watch today will be around 30 frames per second. It has to be at least 14 to 15 for you to detect motion. Below that, it gets a little choppy. Uh, some of your higher quality streams are going to be about 60 frames per second. Um, and then some, you know, some real slow motion cameras are going to bump that up even further. So, 
if you look at this, if you look at these two frames lined up, think about that. 30 frames per second. Here's two frames. There's so much duplication, right? So obviously, video is a great candidate for compression. Uh, so, of course, video is going to be compressed when it's in the video streams like that. So the sequential frames beyond the first frame aren't going to have full encodings of the entire picture, right? It's just going to have what's changed. So when these are rendered on the screen, uh, as the frames progress, we're just going to see uh, the changes. Now, if you think about your video is going to vary, right? Sometimes the picture on the screen is going to stay really similar. So the compression is going to be really high. You're going to have a, a smaller video file as a result. But think about like an action movie on Netflix where you have a lot of changes. Your compression isn't going to be as good for that type of video. So that's one of the, um, one of the first kind of lessons I learned on videos that compression changes and your quality, uh, the amount of bandwidth that you need, the amount of CPU that you need to decode that is going to change with the type of video that you're on as well. Um, if you've ever used like GoToMeeting where you just have one solid slide up there for a long amount of time and you, like, you've recorded your screen, that's going to be a really small file, right? So uh, really high compression there. Now, uh, the first frame, like the, key, the frame that has the full image, those are called key frames. The subsequent frames that only encode uh, changes from the, progressive, uh, from the previous frames, those are called P frames, which stands for predicted. And uh, there's one more type of frame, which is your B frame. So uh, just to recap, you start with keyframes, which are also called iframes, to, to make it more uh, easy for you to understand. <laughs> and then there's P frames. P frames are going to reference frames in front of it. And the other type of frames are B frames. So B frames are actually going to reference frames on both sides of, the, of, the, uh, of it on the stream. Um, different codecs are going to use, like some codecs won't even use B frames. Some will just have I and P frames. Uh, H.264, which we use, which I'll talk about in a second. Is, uh, does use B frames. So um, if you look at this video, uh, you see that you're going to start with a keyframe, right? That's because when you start the video playback, we have to render the whole picture at that point in time. And then as the playback progresses through the, the, the stream of video, it's just going to update for the motion. But you can't have only one keyframe in your video, because imagine that if you have like 10 minutes of video and you want to seek to uh, eight minutes in, for it to construct that frame, it's going to have to reference all the reference frames from that P frame for it to render. So the gap between the key frames is known as it's the key the keyframe interval. Um, and when you, based off your video, you're going to encode your video with different keyframes. So for Huddle, when we upload video and our coaches are going to use it, it's pretty common for us to have seek events where coaches want to go back and see something. So we're going to actually encode ours with a keyframe interval of 60. So every two seconds, there's a keyframe. Um, some video, uh, like on Netflix, is going to have a much larger keyframe interval. And as a result of that, seeking is going to change, the behavior around seeking, right? So if you've ever been on Netflix and you try to seek to like a very precise frame in the video, you might notice that it, it, it might bounce around a little bit. Uh, certain players are going to decide to, um, uh, they're going to make different decisions based off their, their trade-offs, right? So it, it might decide to just take you to the nearest keyframe and begin playback from that point. It also might decide to uh, go with the accurate seeking approach, which is going to actually decode that frame and then start your playback from that time. But there's going to be a cost that it's going to incur to do that. Um, yeah, so that's the keyframe interval. Like I said, 240 is like the average, um, seemingly, like across all the video. But there's really not a right answer it's based off your behavior. Yeah. So between those two key, first two key frames there, yep. how many actual frames are there? That's going to be. Let's say we're doing 30 frames a second. Yeah, that's going to be a setting based off your encoding. So when we encode our video, our video, we encode at 60 key, uh, a keyframe interval of 60. So every two seconds, there's a keyframe. But uh, like, it's, uh, like I mentioned, some other uh, sites with different experiences that might not need the high seek accuracy that we do might have a larger keyframe interval to uh, increase the compression. Less keyframes, you get more, you get better compression, less overall size of your video that you're distributing. So, yep. Yeah, we roll at 30 frames per second for most of our video. We do a huddle technique. What I'm going to demonstrate in, um, in a bit is a shorter form video, and we actually capture it 60 frames per second, I believe, is where we start at. I think you might be able to turn it up on that. So. I have one more question. Yep. Could you give an example like, oh, what, like two gigs? Uh, you know, like, what's the yeah, so, I mean, like, like exactly how big? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've seen like an hour go-to meeting be around like one gigabyte, whereas like an hour of film 
uh, for our standard huddle video would be more like 2.5 gigabytes. So uh, it, it's, it's not negligible. So cool. OK, so iframes, uh, P frames, B frames. Uh, the impact is seeking accuracy and then decode uh, the decode cost if you want to start rendering at a non keyframe. Uh, what I've been talking about so far has been progressive video. Uh, I just wanted to throw out that there's also interlaced video. Um, interlaced video, actually, uh, a single frame combines two frames. And the idea is that when it plays, uh, it increases the motion factor without using extra bandwidth. Uh, the usage of interlaced frames is on the decline. Uh, with FFmpeg, you can de-interlace. Uh, and that's what we do at Huddle. We, we de-interlace all of our video and turn it into progressive. So. Uh, so the frames and uh, how the keyframes, the B frames, the P frames are all combined into a stream, uh, that's done using a codec. Uh, the word codec comes from encode and decode. Um, so basically, that's just the rules, the guidelines, and actually the libraries that are going to compress your, uh, your frames into your stream that is, a codec, that is encoded in a particular codec. Uh, codecs are going to come from all different places, from corporations, standards groups, and there's a lot of different codecs that are out there. There's two main types of codecs. Uh, that's lossless codecs. And um, they're going to preserve quality at, at all costs, um, disregarding the overhead of that quality. And then there's lossy codecs. And those codecs are going to allow reductions to achieve higher compression. So this just results in fewer number of bits that you need to move around to play video. But uh, ultimately, you might get a picture that's a little more pixelated. Like if you see this example on the right, you might not be able to tell from where you're sitting, but it, it is just a little more pixelated. So um, there might not be quite as many colors in it, and it, and it just doesn't um, look as clear. So some examples of lossy codecs, uh, H.264, which is pretty much the standard today. That's, been, uh, that's pretty ubiquitous across digital video. H.265 is the future. Uh, it's, um, it, it's not supported broadly yet, but um, in several years, I wouldn't be surprised if most video is running on H.265. Uh, additionally, there's like uh, VC1, which is an old codec that um, you often see in like, uh, WMV files. Then AAC and MP3 are actually audio codecs. And some lossless codecs, um, a common example here is uh, the Blu-ray Blu-ray codec, you can have H.264 that's lossless as well. So, OK, so uh, containers are probably the file formats that you're used to seeing when you're playing video. So this is going to be like MP4, MPEG-TS, MP3, WMV, AVI. The containers are going to contain within them streams that are encoded with codecs. Um, and, and decoders are just way, a way to uh, kind of bridge the gap between users and decoders. Uh, because the video and audio streams can be decoded in, in several different ways. So it's, it's nice to just have all that data distributed to you in one, uh, one container, one file format. OK, so to recap, containers contain streams of video that encode frames in particular codecs. Make sense? Any questions? OK. Why are there so many? Uh, different containers. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, they come from corporations like Apple, Google, Adobe. Uh, they also come from standards groups. Uh, ISO has founded uh, the MPEG group, which you're probably familiar, or you've probably heard like MPEG, MP4. That's the Motion Pictures Expert Group. Uh, JPEG, which is um, for like the still image encoding. That's the Joint Photographic Experts Group. Um, and then actually, there was some news today. John? Yeah, well, if you guys follow TechCrunch at all, too, there was also an article today where Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, Mozilla, a couple other big companies are deciding to create their own, what's it called? Like global something media, conglomerate, something like that. Open media? And they're already creating a new format. So yeah. Because there's not, there's not enough already. Yeah. So the real reason why is there so many options, I thought that this uh, cartoon uh, made sense. So the current state is 14, right? And it's like, well, let's create one that encapsulates all of, the, all of the, everybody's uses. And then, then the current state is you have 15 codecs. <laughs> so <sighs> yeah, OK.
So that was kind of like the uh, underlying infrastructure within video. Let's talk about some use cases and like some things you might actually want to do with your video containers. A common one is streaming, like MP4s. So you've got this large MP4 file. You're going to want to play it on your iPad or on your mobile device. Uh, a couple of concerns are going to come, uh, you know, come to the forefront right away. The first thing is you're probably not going to want to download the whole MP4 before you start playback. Um, so the MP4 format actually, uh, when you encode them with FFmpeg, you, you have to do a few things to make that possible. One of them is um, within the container, you have the, the metadata and the tags. Um, if you just encode the MP4 with FFmpeg, but you don't specify a couple flags, it's going to put those at the end of the file. So it's not going to allow you to play it without having the full representation locally. Um, so uh, you definitely need to specify that. You know, that said, like MP4s are good candidates for online streaming. Like they they do okay, but there's some deficiencies there, particularly like around seeking. Um, to do seeking without you know progressive without having downloaded progressively into the file that point of the video, you have to do byte range requests, which don't really perform very well. Um, so in short, like you can stream MP4s and it works, but there's also a whole new suite of technologies that you probably need to look at if you're getting serious about online video, and that's the streaming protocols. Um, uh, among the streaming protocols are HDB live streaming, which comes to us from Apple. Um, it's not even an official codec, but it's, it's widely used across, or it's not even an official standard, excuse me, but it's, it's widely used uh, across Apple products. It's actually what Huddle uses. MPEG Dash is going to be what Netflix and, and uh, YouTube use today, so you've probably interacted with that. Um, Microsoft has smooth streaming, which I actually don't know a lot about. Um, all of these are going to follow a similar architecture, but they all you know, definitely have their differences. So I'm going to just talk about the HLS architecture. So the general idea with HLS is that instead of having a single large video uh, file you know, that is a container that encodes all of your video, we're going to separate that up into two to 10 second chunks. There's not a hard rule on the size of them. You can kind of vary that based off what you need. But, um, and, and you're going to have separate chunks of video uh, two to ten seconds long, and you're gonna have a manifest that's gonna link to those videos. So this gives your um, this gives your player the ability to just download the particular files that it needs to render the, the particular time and video that you're referencing. Um, the benefit here is uh, you know HLS is built entirely on HTTP. So if the internet works from the location that the user is viewing the video, uh, it, HLS is going to work, right? We don't need any other protocols open. It's it's all on HTTP. Um, so like a sample um, uh, HLS manifest or an M3 U8 file is going to look like this. So there's a couple of header tags up at the top. And then there's also just the, the, the chunks of video. So if I launch this video and I seek 10 seconds in, it doesn't need to download the first eight seconds of video. It can just grab the second fragment and uh, segment and begin playing it. So additionally, most of these streaming protocols are going to do uh, what's commonly known as adaptive streaming. That means they're going to adjust the uh, resolution of the video uh, based off your screen size and your current network. So if we're on an iPhone, we don't need to ship 1080p to that, uh, particularly if you're on a slower network where you're going to have buffer events. Um, so adaptive streaming, you're going to actually encode different resolutions of your video. So you're going to have duplicates of those on your server. And you're going to have duplicate manifests. And then you're going to provide a variant manifest that gives the information of which stream to use based off the bandwidth and the resolution. So uh, a sample variant manifest is going to look like this. Uh, this is probably hard to read, but uh, basically there's just stream tags that says that this bandwidth and this resolution use this stream. Uh, and there's uh, a couple of different options. So yeah, that's going to be uh, the streaming protocols. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about FFmpeg. So FFmpeg is an open source tool that um, self proclaims itself as uh, a tool that you can use to uh, encode, transcode uh, all, pretty much all media created by uh, man. So, um, and from my experience, that's been that's been true for the most part. I've never encountered a format that wasn't supported. Uh, if you're going to interact with FFmpeg, uh, it's just command line arguments. So. Uh, there's a couple global options you can give it. You give it your input files, you give it your output files, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do the magic for you. Um, things that you might do on FFmpeg would be like muxing. So you might have you know, video and audio that you want to combine into like an MP4. Um, muxing is uh, 
comes from the word multiplexing, which means like to mix signals. So um, in this case, we're not actually changing the codec. We're just putting them together into one file, so it's called muxing. Um, it's a pretty simple command. The other thing you might want to do is you might want to actually change the codec of your video. That's called transcoding. Um, so like you have a WMV uh, and you want to switch it to an MP4, you can do that with, with FFmpeg. So uh, at Huddle, we get video that comes from all different types of recorders all in all different types of formats, and then we transcode it and uh, uh, make it available over HTTP live streaming. So we have to do a lot of processing. Yep. You, you might. <laughs> um, it, it depends on what codec you're coming from and going to. Um, you don't have to, though. I mean, you can preserve quality, from my experience, like, for the most part. So, yeah. Um, OK. So here's like a sample uh, FFmpeg command to transcode. So this is going to take an input WMV, and then it's going to provide an output that's an MP4 file. And then we just have to provide the dash C colon video. That's going to be the codec that it's going to use for the video. So I want to encode it to H.264. Um, and then I'm going to provide the audio codec. And then I'm going to give those two flags that I mentioned that are going to allow us to stream this uh, before we've downloaded the full file on the web. And I'm going to say an output file of FMPEG. Throw us on the command line, and it's going to start the output. Um, transcoding is CPU expensive. Uh, it, it's CPU bound, definitely. On my MacBook Pro, I can encode I could encode this command at around 30 frames per second. So an hour of video for our video is going to take about an hour to transcode. So uh, at Huddle, we uh, we do all of our encoding on the cloud on an uh, auto scaling uh, EC2 cluster. But it's just FFmpeg commands running under the sheets, which is kind of cool. Um, and here's a command if you want to take uh, an MPEG TS file and generate a uh, HTTP live stream. So you just encode all of your MP4 video into one uh, TS file, throw it into this segmenter. It's going to produce the segment results. Um, these are going to produce four second uh, HLS segments. Um, the HLS, HLS list size is going to say don't limit the number of, uh, like, total number of segments in their manifest. And uh, then it's just going to give a file template name for the, t the TS fragments that it's going to generate. No, it's open source. Yep. Um, yep, it's open source. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's uh, there's binaries on the website. Just download them for your appropriate operating system. And fire it up. So, put the executable on the class path. What's that? Yeah, it's a command line tool like how, how we use it. So it's just an executable. You drop on drop on the class path, and this command would work. So. Cool. So uh, in short, there's a lot of things you can do with FMPEG. It's pretty vast. Um, you can crop, uh, concat, add text, add images, et cetera. Um, and it, it's, it's really large. But your end output is going to be something like this. This is a huddle highlight that we generated with FFmpeg. So I'm going to launch this real quick, hopefully. So this would be a, 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 I think it was a lacrosse player that I grabbed, or maybe it was a football player. But uh, the the clips were all uh, concatted together. The uh, spot shadows were added with FFmpeg. The watermark down in the bottom left was added with FFmpeg. Um, yeah. So cool. Uh, I'm actually showing this in the YouTube player because our slides would only let us import YouTube, but. Uh, we have an embedded player to it, Huddle. Oops. So who identifies the player? Is that the coach that's highlighting that player? Oh, uh, athletes can create their own highlights, actually. Yeah. So uh, they identify, I don't know a lot about the highlight creation process, actually, but uh, the highlights will go build those and publish those to their own profile. So uh, let me back up. And who puts, who picks the background? So we have our own um, uh, we have our own background music that we own the license to, and then we have like a library that they can choose from, and then it all gets muxed together and, and, and rendered on our rendering farm and published. So. Cool. Yeah, of course. 
Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So um, th there's a couple other tools that I want to mention that I'm not going to talk about really in depth. One is FF Probe. FF Probe is great for uh, getting di diagnostics information off of your streams, off of your frames. Um, if you want to analyze your video, get a lot of a lot of data, you can use FF Probe. It's like it's a sub project within FFmpeg. There's also FF Play, which is an open source you know, video player. Um, FF Server is actually a, a server that you can use for real time broadcasts. Um, uh, haven't done a lot with FF Server, but it's out there if, if you have that particular need. So, um, it, with that, I also want to plug Huddle's FFmpeg um, .NET wrapper that we've actually open sourced on GitHub. Um, so if you want to interact with FFmpeg from uh, .NET, it can be kind of cumbersome to generate all your command line commands um, and then just fire off a process. So we've actually open sourced a wrapper for FFmpeg. Um, yep. Do you yeah. Run FFmpeg on Linux or Windows servers? Uh, both actually. For the most part, Windows though. Huh. Actually, for the most part, Linux. Excuse me. Cool. And then another thing about FFmpeg is, like all open source projects, they are susceptible to problems. There is an FFmpeg uh, fork, which is libav. Um, and to make things really confusing, FFmpeg actually calls its internal libraries libav. But um, some developers like broke off a fork about four years ago, and it got really confusing when libav actually shipped on some versions of uh, uh, Ubuntu. So if you ran FFmpeg commands, it was saying like some of them were deprecated. That's because libav was already installed. Um, so uh, not picking sides, just saying <laughs> there is a fork out there. FFmpeg is, is still what we use. If you want to read about uh, like some of the conflict and what happened, I, I threw a bitly in there. So <coughs> any questions about video or FM, FFmpeg? Cool. Well, with that, we'll talk about, uh, I'll turn it over to John, talk about Android. All right, so I'm going to go over just the Android stuff. Um, we might get, probably not get to iOS today, though. Um, so for mobile, we just care about getting our video and playing it so our end user can actually watch our video. You probably don't care too much about the codecs, the containers, the protocols, whatever it is. Um, but it's really great to know. Um, I've been at Huddle for the past three months. Before getting there, I knew absolutely nothing about video. Um, so it's great learning about this stuff. Um, like our, our title said, trials, tribulations, and triumphs. So a lot of the trials we had um, Huddle had last year was just playing video on Android was just terrible. Um, you know, the video was dropping quality, the video was crashing, and for at least in the United States, it's not a huge problem because a lot of uh, the people are using iOS. But when you go over to overseas, um, a large population of Europe and China, it's going to be an Android based uh, market. So that's why we're starting to ramp up our Android development. So just give me my video, right? Um, a lot of my talk today is going to be um, highly based on this talk right here from a Google Dev Byte by Oliver Woodman, um, ExoPlayer. Check it out. It's on their YouTube site. So before we talk about ExoPlayer, though, we need to talk about Media Player. So if there is any Android devs in here and you've worked with video back in, I think it was back even in version 1-ish, um, like 1 1.2 or something, Media Player was introduced. Um, Google made a really easy way for developers just to play a video right onto the screen, a um, couple, couple lines of code. Um, it was really nice to begin with, but as things progress, as adaptive streaming and HLS dash, as Andy pointed out, is starting to gain momentum, media player isn't the best option moving forward. But in order, to understand, and in order to understand why it's not the best, we need to probably look at what makes it up. Um, there's a couple of modular components um, inside a media player that you can't actually access um, in it, uh, originally. Networking obviously involves getting your data, if it's a remote URL or if it's a local file. Either way, it's going to load that data into your player. You're going to have a buffering module. There's buffering policies. How much do I buffer? How long do I buffer until there's a timeout? Those kind of things are involved. Um, what do we got? Uh, an extractor um, just to extract the actual file itself. Um, so then we can finally get into decoding those files and finally rendering them onto your screen and to your speakers. And that's going to be all wrapped, wrapped around a player logic, which is what you're most familiar with if you're working on Android. Um, you're going to, you know, media player dot play, dot seek, dot pause, all those kind of callbacks are going to come through the player logic, which you actually interact with. Um, and so here's your code. It's super simple. Um, 
if you know Google or Android at all, um, Google is usually more suitable for engineers. They have mathematical truths, I like to say, um, whereas Apple is more user friendly. Um, it, it's really easy to develop an Apple and iOS for the most part, where Google actually took this approach and they said, we're going to make it super easy for you to develop. Um, but what they didn't think about was extens extensibility and customizability from the very beginning. Um, and so that's when developers started getting into low-level APIs. So Jellybean, Jellybean came around. Um, there's wrappers around these now. Uh, media extractors, media codecs, and audio tracks. Um, if you were looking at the APIs and saw the change, log and re change logs and release notes, you would have seen that these were actually available for you back in about 4.1, 4.2, right? Um, but Google realized that like a lot of not, not a lot of people were actually using these to create new players. You could have used these to build a new player instead of using Android's media player, but nobody did that. Um, so it would have looked like this. You could have had your own application level player disregarding Android SDKs, using straight Java, and then hooking into these low level APIs in Android. Uh, you could have even moved them around. You could have had your networking buffering and extraction point inside your player so that you had more control over it. You had more just customizability, which would have been really nice if we knew how to do that, but nobody did. So then here comes Google to the rescue, like always. Um, they created what's called ExoPlayer. It's open sourced. It's on GitHub right now. You can um, bring it down through Gradle, whatever you want to do with it. Um, send them some pull requests, whatever you want to do, you know? Um, ExoPlayer, it allows Dash, HLS, smooth streaming. So now we get those adaptive qualities that Andy had talked about. Um, videos now in chunk formats, uh, quality changes. Uh, it's really nice. And YouTube, Play Movies, and even Huddle now are using them in their apps. So if, you've, if you're watching Netflix, I think Netflix is using it now too, not to mention them, but um, if you're watching YouTube on your phone, you're probably, you're probably seeing like a large increase of quality probably now, now these days instead of like a year, two years ago. <laughs> So this is one of those reasons why. Um, when we first started implementing ExoPlayer, we needed metrics around it. Uh, Huddle being a huge video company. Load times, seek times, buffer times, retention rates, all those things mattered to us. Um, and you can just see the chart right here. It sort of speaks for itself on the speeds that we were coming up with. And just uh, a fairly decent sample size. It wasn't the best sample size. But over the past three months now, we're getting some actual good quality metrics. And I just like this quote down here, too, that says, beyond two seconds, a one second increase in delay increases the abandonment rate by 5.8%. Um, and this was taken by JW Player, another company that does video libraries that we actually use on the web um, as well at Huddle. And it just shows like your load times, your seek times, your buffer times really do matter. They did this research um, around a huge sample size, and that's what they came up with. So it really does matter. Yeah. So we actually did, we just used um, our own logging API in the back end, and that logs to our own um, database. Like we use Sumo Logic right now. Uh, before we, we were using Splunk, and then we just did manual queries on that. So we didn't use any actual analytic libraries, but we could have probably. It was just, it was already in place, so why not use it? Um, and that also eventually gets logged to like FOLA, which is like a SQL sort of database too, so we can do queries over. 10 years of time and see how that metrics look. So metrics are huge. Um, they're awesome. So what's, so I guess the next question is, how is ExoPlayer built? Uh, basically, it uses those low-level APIs and then uses a lot of different components to it. Uh, if you remember the media player uh, five lines of code I showed you, that was all you need to play media player. If you wanted to roll your own ExoPlayer setup, it's going to take a lot more work, but you're going to get a lot better speeds and a lot, of, a lot better customizability. So you're going to need uh, track renders for audio and video. Um, you're going to need extractors that extract out different sample sources from those data sources. So plugging in your data source to your sample source to your renderers. Uh, it's, it's a process, but it's, it works. Um, now that, that was just for MP4. HLS is a little different because we have HLS chunk sources, which we talked about before. It's segmented out two to ten second samples, and the next oh, and then also on top of that, 
you can customize. So if we wanted to use a cache as a data source, we can do that. If we want to add an extra renderer for maybe stereo output for audio or different renderers, we can do that as well. Next would be Dash and smooth streaming. Um, there's actually a really good article on bitcoden.com that shows a, a basically like a matrix and a feature chart of Dash, HLS, uh, smooth streaming, and Adobe's uh, adaptive streaming as well. And you can sort of see the different features. And Dash actually has a lot more features involved in it. I believe Huddle will be moving to Dash eventually, hopefully with the next year or so. But it's a, it's a huge process and undertaking to take on. Back to this. Um, the nice thing about Dash is that you can actually have a different stream for your renders. So if you want a separate stream of chunks for your audio versus your video, you can do that. You have the ability to do that. Um, as well as customizing your evaluators for your chunks. So we talked about the adaptive part about HLS. Uh, if you were to use the HLS version of ExoPlayer, you're going to get the whatever your variant of your manifest says for changing your evaluators. Whereas with Dash, you can actually change your evaluators on the fly dynamically. So if for some reason you want to say, I want, to, I want the better variant of this version of the video, give me that version. So. It's pretty cool. And of course, um, default load controls and customizability as well. Uh, last thing to point out about Dash on Android, with this customizability, because of the extra render, uh, well, so because of the extra stream for each render, if you wanted an extra render for like um, custom overlays, annotations, which we'll be getting into in Huddle eventually, you can actually do that. So then you have a, a separate track, as you can see, going along with each render which is just really nice that way it keeps things in sync and you can actually um, have fallbacks if one of those didn't work. So if annotations were corrupted for some reason, you could have a fallback and not worry about your video being disrupted as well. Um, so here's a quick video actually just to demonstrate the differences between Media Player on Android versus ExoPlayer on Android in our Huddle app. Um, and so the load times initially are a little long on Media Player maybe about a second. Seek times, again, you're buffering. And you can just see the, the time. It's like, if I'm watching my video right now, I'm already you know, somewhat upset. Like I'm probably going to push the back button and just leave this alone and watch it on my computer or something instead. So then, as soon as we implemented ExoPlayer, we have our own sample app that we're testing with and logging metrics around. Load time, seek time, just like that. It's snappy. And this is only MP4, too. So it's not even HLS that does the chunks. It's just MP4. And it just shows the difference that Android has done from moving from Media Player to Excel Player. So even if you're not working with HLS or Dash, move to Excel Player. It's going to imp improve your MP4 playback tremendously. So, so the code that you're showing us there resides on the server and that's where you're where you're streaming the video from or where where is all this so all code that you're creating and customizing yeah so all of this code is actually on an android device so this would be all on android okay so this would be in the app that you've written there yep okay. yeah so there's there's a lot more components to exoplayer which is this new library that google created but it just it's, it speaks for itself in the speed and quality that it provides so um yeah. And then. Both streaming from the same <coughs> location. Yeah. Data. Sa same, same video path, same server at Huddle, same connection. Yeah, all that. So. That's about thread management. How does that work? Do you control it? Do they control it? So, th that's a good question. Um, in terms of the video itself, it's somewhat hooked into the Android activity lifecycle or fragment lifecycle, depending on what you choose. Uh, but there isn't too many like actual video threads that you have to worry about as a developer in terms of the library. Um, we do our own threading in regards to seeking, or not seeking, but the actual seek bar itself at the bottom to update it and stuff like that. Um, eventually, there'll be other threads as well to add annotations and overlays on top of that. But like. 
the actual video itself, it's all contained inside the libraries. Whether you're using media, pl media player or Excel player, it's going to hook into your Android activity lifecycle, and you're good to go. So. Are you only supporting Joey Bean Plus because of the, uh, the libraries? Sort of. We're supporting, yes, we're, we're supporting Joey Bean Plus because of that. But then we also have a fallback that says if your API check is lower than this, we're going to give you our crappy solution that predated that. So, um, well, actually, I lied. We, ch we changed that. We actually said our crappy solution was so crappy that we're not going to give it to you at all. And we actually did bump up. So now, if you don't have 4.1, I think, then you don't get any more updates for Huddle on Android. So, which is, which is fine. We, I mean, that's, that's just as a company, you have to decide those things. You have to decide the metrics. And nobody was able to watch video, really, for people that were watching basketball films. So, cool. You want to show this one, Rick? Yeah, we just got one more slide. So, um, you can just play it. Yeah. And it's all easier on a Mac, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so, the last thing we were going to talk about was Huddle Technique. In this video, we're going to show you how to do the app. Just play back our video at regular speed. So uh, Ubersense, yeah, I can just um, Ubersense was a company that Huddle acquired a year ago, um, and they uh, they f they have a really different use case for video. So whereas uh, Huddle uh, was traditionally you know long form video uh, for like football games, basketball games, etc., Ubersense is individual focused video. Um, and so uh, because of that, you're going to encode your video a little bit different. So I'm just going to play the demo, and then I'll, um, I'll talk about it as, it, as it's done. We've uh, recently rebranded re Ubersense to be Huddle Technique, so you might see some old, uh, old logos. We can also play back in slow motion by pressing the slow-mo button and choosing from a couple different slow-mos to play back out. We can control our video frame by frame by using the find slow at the bottom of the screen. This allows us to control the video slowly and accurately forward or backward to get to the exact frame you want. So you can see like it's short form video that would help you on an, on an individual basis. It's going to help you with your golf swing, your baseball swing, your uh, diving. So we encode it at a much higher frame rate. Um, I believe it starts at 60 frames per second. It might actually bump up beyond that. Um, seeking is a lot more important, so there's going to be a lower keyframe interval there. Um, and it's just video that you're going to use generally. So I just wanted to kind of contrast the, the diversity of video that you're going to encounter online, some coding decisions you might make based off that. So, mm -hmm. Teams that are recording games and things like that are using typically what HD quality cameras? Um, yeah, I mean, some of them, um, most of our video comes in at, at well, I, a, a, major, a, a big portion of our video, I don't know exactly how much, comes in at 720p. Um, so some are going to record it with a real expensive camera that's going to get 1080p. Um, the most we're going to serve from, from Huddle's website is going to be 720p. And a lot so. of that's actually recorded on an iPad. At least for yeah. basketball as well. Yeah, we have a, a capture uh, app on iOS where you can uh, capture at 720p. You can also, uh, you know, if you have your own camera, you can do your own recording and then upload your video to Huddle. So, yep. So when that video capture application, is that something you wrote or do you use the native capture? Um, so we do use, we use the AV Foundations framework for the capture part, but then we own everything uh, like behind that. So as it, as it comes off AV Capture, it comes to us in H.264, um, and then we own, uh, yeah, we, we publish it, change, we re-encode it, change some settings on it, and then publish it for consumption when the recording's complete. So. Okay. Um, with that, we'll... Uh, that's our last slide, so How much of this any questions? archived? Can a school go back, say they started with you two years ago, can they go back two years? Or do they you can. Do they keep a window? Or? No, we, keep, uh, we, don't, we don't delete video currently, um, so it's, it's, it's all there. So they can go back and reference their previous seasons, as long as they have an active subscription. I think the, I think the only limit, it depends on your subscription, but it's limited against opponent scout films, right? Exactly, yeah. So certain we only store like certain hours. Yeah. 
Yep. So you can categorize your film as game film, practice film, or opponent scout film. So if I'm scouting my opponent, we're actually going to count against that. So. Yep. So as far as like your actual game footage, yeah, it's, it's unlimited. And who's your? Where you? Where's the cloud here? Who's cloud are you? So the the video is stored on S3, Amazon's uh, S3 solution. So. Yep. No hardware. Any questions? Yep. Uh, you said when you were doing on your local machine, you were transcoding. You said it usually can take up to an hour, hour for an hour video. Sure. So that's when we're actually taking like a WMV and we're uh, decoding uh, like a Microsoft codec with inside that, and then re-encoding it to H.264. So it, it extracts all the frames and then regenerates the P frames, the B frames for the compression. It's really CPU intensive. Okay. So here's a question: like, if I were to upload a Yep. It's available to me almost instantly, it seems like. Yeah, so. It's not necessarily a shorter video, but it feels like that's just way faster. Like, how, how would they be doing this? They might, um, there's a couple different things they could do. They might parallelize, um, parallelize some of the encoding so they don't actually encode it from front to back. They might actually chop it up into bits and uh, serve it out to a server farm and then encode them in segments and then reassemble them. Um, yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Yeah. The other thing is, is if you upload it and it's already in the codec that they're going to serve it on, they don't need to re-encode it. Right. And muxing is significantly faster than transcoding, so that could help with your upload times as well. Is the 720p limitation because of, of, your, of your back end, or is it like what um, uh, iPads actually record it in? Um, I believe you. I don't know if you can record in 1080p on an iPad. I'm not sure on that, actually. Um, potentially some. We also support recording on iPhones, so I think like our, our lowest encoding is um, uh, like some devices won't. I don't think iPhone 4s, which we support, can encode in 1080p. I'm not certain of that, so I'd have to check. Right now, like it's, it's our decision based off um, our playback. We, we have plans to support 1080p in the future. It's, it's on our roadmap, definitely. But yep. that goes into it and that's why I didn't show the actual code samples because you're looking at probably 10 to 15 files okay. so it's not like it's not a library you just drag and drop like oh, if okay. you're familiar with like squares Picasso you yeah. know like load this with this into this we're actually working on that right now with huddle is to make a wrapper around exo player so we can give it to the rest of our inner devs and be like huddle player dot with this load yeah. this into you this think, you think somebody would do that second level off the track. yeah so we, we, we might open source it I don't know like what that would entail but um, yeah, so it's like, yeah, you got to build a lot of renders, you got to build those sample sources, all those chunk sources, okay. multiple Java files, but it's worth the worth the hassle. So, and like I said, Excel Player's GitHub account, uh, Google, it's on Google's you know GitHub organization. They have it all open source, and they have demo applications as well. So you can look at the demo application, what it takes to build it, as well as a demo or as a third-party module. So other people are actually adding on modules to it, which are sort of like add-ons to Excel Player. So if you if somebody eventually adds a module that you're like, oh I would really like this, it's closed captioning or it's like subtitles, then you can copy that, drag it down, you know, pull it down too. So it's a good like community just to already get started. What's what's driving the change there in terms of improvement of the quality going from where it was buffering and buffering to where it's nice and smooth to be able to drag that. Is that Clients saying it's dropping, it's buffering. Can you make it better, or you guys just think we can make it oh. better, and, and by doing so, we'll attract more clientele? Yeah, I mean it's like so within Huddle. Why did we start researching um, changes to the player? Yeah, it was clients complaining basically. I mean we knew that the, the Android solution hadn't been worked on in quite a while. Most of our we don't have feature parity across iOS and Android, um, and we needed to we needed to bring the Android solution up to par. So um, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Like, we were, besides clients saying, hey, your video's crappy, we were actually getting crash reports in the Play Store, too. So, like, if you're seeing crashes upon crashes, you know your play, your video's not doing well, which adds to that. So, so I'll just 
the stats that you were showing up there earlier that you're starting to collect on you know, the players, files, et cetera, are you capturing any uh, network connectivity data there as well? Yeah, so yeah, I don't know if you could have seen it probably from that angle, but yeah, so we were, we we're capturing network uh, connectivity, uh, which which media player, you know. Signal strength. Yep, uh, all that stuff, so. And it, it was, you know, we're seeing obviously Wi Fi is faster, about <coughs> one second faster than 4G. 3G is actually like, like so if, if I think the, the slide said Wi Fi is for actual players two seconds, 4G is like about three seconds, 3G is going to be at like almost like 10 seconds. So it's a huge like jump in speeds there. So basically, if you're watching video on 3G, just give up, turn your phone off. It's <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. That's a dramatic improvement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty substantial. Definitely. Cool. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah.